Well, good morning, everyone. We got their coffee and some snacks, so we have a little sugar in us. So when, we, when I was asked to talk about global market traceability dynamics, who heard my husband give the talk last year at the meeting? Okay, raise your hands high. I'm not near as funny as he is. He used a lot of cartoons. He said he didn't know if many people got him, didn't know if he'd ever be invited back. Uh, but we've been asked to talk about it again this year. I've taken a little different angle than he did last year, but we're all focused, if I can get my technology to work here. Am I messing with you over there? Yeah, I have to, I have to do everything off that one slide. So... Um, Today, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of picture about what's going on with our export markets. And Aaron, who in this room knows Aaron with USMEF, I, act, I called Aaron. I said, Aaron, I need a slide set going into this meeting because she's going to have the most updated slides relative to the economics and what's happening. So she was very gracious. And so you're going to see a bunch of her slides here at the beginning. I wish she was here to talk through those slides, but she wouldn't travel with me. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about, you know, based on where we're at with export markets today, is traceability important to the global marketplace? I think that's probably easy to answer with just this slide, but I'm going to keep going through it. Um, what are other global exporters doing? So when you look at the world, what are they doing? What has the U.S. accomplished since 2003? And it's unfortunate that 2000. Three seems to be the barometer in the U.S. when we look at global markets, but that's when we lost access. And you'll see with these charts, because of BSE, to most of our really valued international markets. We kept a few open, but most of our really valuable international markets we lost access to overnight. So what have we done since then to rebuild the confidence, and how does livestock identification and traceability build into that overall picture? And then where do we go from here? You know, what's, what's really interesting here today is the optimism around the topic, um, the engagement, the really trying to figure out, and it's the first time I've heard it in years at this level of optimism, about really trying to come together with all of the issues surrounding livestock identification traceability and trying to figure out those best solutions for everyone involved, knowing that everyone has a different issue that they're trying to address. So I think that's um, exciting as we move forward. Just quickly about who we are. Um, we started as IMI Global today. The parent company is where food comes from. Um, since that time, as we look at livestock identification and traceability, IMI Global's primary focus is in the beef industry. We do some in pork, but primarily in the beef industry. Validus Verification Services has a stronger footprint in pork and poultry and egg-laying hens. And then we have some of these niche organizations that work on organic certification, sustainability programs and metrics, all of which livestock identification and traceability becomes an important component of all of those different things that we do. So when you look at this year, and Aaron's first slide here, where U.S. beef and variety meat exports are to set new records this year, you, you look at this trend line, right, and you see, I don't know if this has a pointer on it, but you guys can see with the trend line how you had that dip in 2003 and how we've been slowly working our way back. We have surpassed um, those levels before 2003 when it comes to a value perspective, and if you look at what she's forecasting this year, it's up 7% year over year on volume with metric tons being exported out of the country for beef and up 15% in value. And value is the one um, that really we need to pay attention to as we look to some of these charts and the impact on the overall beef industry. So you can see we've continued to gain back market share, continued to gain back consumer confidence, even with the issues that we've been dealing with. So that's, that's very positive. When you look at pork and pork variety meat, same sort of trend line, right? We're continuing to export more and more and more. Now, we've had some issues this year worldwide um, with disease issues in pork, and we've also had issues when you look at some of them, the political banter around tariffs and, and the challenges with tariffs. That really comes to play a lot, and you've seen that impact pork exports this year. 
When you look at what that means to the folks that are deciding on whether to put in a tag, right, at, at the ranch of origin, um, what becomes really important for them to understand, and I always step back and say, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, why do the export markets matter? And I start to show them these slides. Well, the export markets matter significantly to the value of the cattle coming off your cow-calf operation. And when you look at this, this shows where. So today, USMEF is contributing over $318 per head per fed animal that the export markets contribute back to an individual animal price, fed animal price. That's huge. Pork, you're looking at $54 per head. Those, those numbers, that ratio continues to go up, and I'll show you some graphs relative to that. So the export markets are very critical to everyone in the livestock industry today. You can also see from these pie charts who are valuable export markets are, and this is based on dollars, right? So this is a dollar um, explanation. So you see Japan, Korea, Mexico, Canada, China, others. So you see those major markets that depending on how they look at animal identification and traceability, the impact, the subsequent impact it can have on our industry if we were to lose access because of that issue, right? So you start to see how valuable those markets are. You also see with this trend line, which I think is, when you look at how steep this trend line is, how much more important it's become over the last, just even the last three years. Export as a contributing factor to overall cattle prices in this country. So, you know, when we talk about evolution and we talk about 840 tags and, not, and manufacturer coded tags, I grew up on a commercial cow-calf operation. My dad is a rancher in southwestern New Mexico. In 1996, John couldn't even, my husband, when he started IMI Global, couldn't get him to put in EID tags. It's like, oh, that's just a cost. We got him to put them in, and now today he's using 840 tags. He's doing all these specialty programs. So we've seen a huge evolution in a segment of the population that has made significant progress. So we don't want to forget about that, and we want to acknowledge that segment of our producers that are doing really good things. So when we talk about the export markets, why are why they're important? We talk about value. Why is that? I always think as export markets, our global partners in trade, as the perfect example of truly a value-add market, because it allows our packer partners to optimize carcass utilization. So they can look at a given market and make sure that we're getting the highest price for a particular product in a given market. So overall, that value on a fed animal basis is higher, and they're the best in the world at it. So the packers know how to utilize and optimize carcass value. What they're looking for, as much as possible, is standardization around those countries' requirements, right? So it makes it easier for them to do their job in their packing plants. Tongues to Japan, this just shows you, $11 per head, contributed value today to fed animals. Short plate, 28 to Japan. Short ribs and chuck short ribs to Korea, $23. We wouldn't get near that if we had to consume those products in the United States. So our trading partners are extremely valuable. Where do we sit? Where does the U.S. sit today? We're the number one beef exporter on a value basis. So I don't know that a lot of people think about this, um, but the U.S. is first, Australia second, and then you can kind of go down the list as where, where we sit with total exports compared to beef producers around the world. You've also seen here, and this chart shows you, that you've seen growth from all major beef exporters. So you see a lot more countries, those major beef producing countries, exporting more and more products as a part of what they do each and every day. You see Brazil's up 8%, Australia's up 14%, and the U U.S. is up 10%. So we're all continuing to compete around the world for these valuable export markets. One of the things that's a little bit unique about U.S. beef, or I should say not just U.S. beef, but grain-fed beef, is that it's unique from a, 
product profile to other products around the world. So it's a little less elastic, right? Price elastic, a little more inelastic than other products that are, um, that are wanted worldwide. So when you have an issue like tariff discussions, yes, it's going to be impactful, but maybe not to the degree that it would be if the product that was produced in Canada and the U.S. and now Australia, those grain-fed products, was it more unique than our competitors around the world? So it makes it a little less um, volatile or vulnerable to some of those things. And that's what's helped us to maintain our market share in these markets, is that really unique, consistent um, grain-fed product that our country produces and the high-quality nature of that product. So does it matter? It absolutely matters. Now, one thing I want to caution everyone on, though, is you don't ever want to look at one year over another in a particular market and say, okay, 100% of that had to do with one particular issue. Because when you look at markets, there's a number of factors that go into whether or not we increase or decrease in a given market in a given year. So you have export prices, so the prices of our products, competing country prices, so how we're competitive globally, exchange rates, consumer preferences within those countries, trade barriers, and then obviously political relations. We haven't seen that more in global trade than we have with the discussions that have been going over the last couple of years. So all of those things will impact whether or not you see a country go up or down in a given year. So you can't take any one issue and really separate it completely. However, it does become very clear cut when you do not have any market access and the condition is specifically because you do not have one thing or another. So relative to livestock identification and traceability, when we can't get market access because they don't approve of what we have in place, then that becomes the issue and it's a very clear cut issue then. When you, when you look at where we are today with those markets that I listed and the markets that we have access to today, each one of the countries has a specific, most of them, not all of them, have a specific export verification requirement. Okay, so after 2003, as we started negotiating trade agreements to get back in, I talked a little bit about this yesterday, the standard that was used was the USDA Process Verify Program and the USDA QSA Program. So that's what plants had to put in place in order to start exporting products again. Well, within each given country, there would be nuances to that export verification instruction. And all that is is specific technical requirements for each country. So many of those don't impact Livestock producers pass the packing plant. Most of that complexity is handled at the packing plant today. There are some examples, however, where those trade agreements have gone back into the supply chain and have impacted um, those supply chains and where identification traceability has become important. So we know Japan was an issue when we first got back into that country. Cattle had to be age verified. And, and so what we decided to tag on to that because it made sense at the time was source verification. So that became the base requirement in 2004 and 2005. You then had, um, you have the European Union, which requires a non-hormone treated cattle program with full animal traceability. That has to be verified all the way back to the ranch of origin. Tags must be put in before they leave the ranch of origin. So very specific requirements for the European Union and thus exporting products to the European Union. You have a variety of, you have an, another one that just came on board, Paula Wynn was that two years ago, Saudi Arabia. So the Saudi Arabia export verification instruction, they came out with a requirement that you can't have animal fat. So that requires the identification of that specific credence attribute for cattle moving out of feed yards if you're going to export products to Saudi Arabia. And then just this last year, our entrance into China required that those cattle be verified at the source of origin. So those are specific high-value markets today 
that have requirements around livestock identification traceability, but I'll tell you they're not all exactly the same. So what programs like, like IMI Global has done is what we've tried to do is kind of set a base level that will meet every country's requirements, or I should say the highest bar for countries' requirements around source verification. And then we add on to that when cow-calf producers, backgrounders, feed yards want to then attain other programs based on the market. So it's 100% market-driven based on the buyers that they want to attract. So just I wanted to step back as I was doing the research for this presentation and talk about some of the great research that's already been done and just um, mention a few quotes that resonated to me as I was getting ready for this presentation. So this is a case state study um, conducted in 2011. The world has recognized significant value in animal identification traceability systems. Concerns for animal and human health, as well as food safety assurances, have motivated efforts to adopt animal ID systems. The most widely recognized inter international animal health, food safety, and trade organizations have endorsed animal ID programs as essential components of food animal production and meat product trade. In response, major beef exporters and importers have developed mandatory animal identification and traceability systems. So that was um, a research study by K-State in 2011. Here's one that was done by um, APHIS, 2009. A critical issue regarding the economic impact of any animal disease outbreak is the ability to contain the disease and restore market access for at least part of the industry as soon as possible. Regionalization or zoning, and those of you that heard Phil Singh talked a lot, really concentrated in on this. Regionalization or zoning could be used so based on a geographic region, it can be demonstrated to be isolated and free of disease incidents. The defined region could then regain international market access more quickly. Animal identification, movement tracking, and inflow and outflow documentation are essential in demonstrating whether an auditable biosecurity management system is present. I think all of those are key things that we need to keep in mind as we are working on um, these, these traceability pilots, as we're evaluating all the different things that we can do and how the industry collaborates together. This was mentioned earlier. I think, um, I think Dr. Shear talked about it. But one thing that's been evident, and this was in a, in a study, that there's been four patterns of world adoption, and he talked a little, about, a little bit about the EU. You've had the adoption of mandatory systems in response to consumer concerns. So they've had serious animal disease instances. So you look at EU and Japan, and that's why they did what they did so quickly. You've had the imposition of mandatory traceability to maintain or enhance export market shares. So when you look at the systems that Australia, Brazil, and Argentina have put in place, that was the impetus for those programs. You have industry-managed mandatory programs for animal identification. So the Canadian system, and then a mix in the U.S. of mandatory government programs, now with ADT, and industry-managed volunteer programs to address some of these issues. So that, to me, is something also, um, there's a quote later on that I read in the World Perspective Study that really resonated me based on those patterns of adoption. And, and one thing that's good to know is, is we want, we want to get there as quickly as possible. I'm just like Ross. I'm just like the, the lady within, I don't know your name, but the lady that said, you know, we need to get there quicker. I think everybody in this room agrees to that completely. Um, I also do think we, th there's some benefit in not having to be the first one to put something in place because it gives us the opportunity, and we're way behind that curve, so we don't have to worry about that. But it gives us the opportunity to really evaluate everything that's been done and try to make sure we implement something that is as right as possible for the majority of interests in the room as possible. And that's very difficult to do um, with livestock identification traceability. When you look at the global perspective study that just came out, here you see the matrix of what's happening around the world with their system. So you can see whether or not a given country had a government mandated system, whether or not they required premise identification, individual animal ID, whether they, whether they identify animals based on group, whether that data was managed by a third party, 
if they had oversight with industry representation. So you see that there's different ways to skin the cat. That's probably not the appropriate term in this audience, but anyway. Um, different ways to get there. But be, there would be way worse audiences to use that phrase, I guess. So I am not going to go through this because I'm sure you cannot even read this. But what I want, the reason I put it in a slide is this is USMEF's beef competitor traceability grid. And you can see, and I'm just moving back and forth, there is not one system around the world that is identical. And when you look at animal identification in Brazil, you know, you've got, you've got color-coded tags based on certain things, and they're only doing it for export markets, so it's really kind of a quasi-mandatory voluntary system. And then you've got Canada that is really honed in on animal, identif uh, animal identification and really standardized that and implemented that. So I think what's important about these slides is it is important to kind of look at what the, what the world has done as we're implementing our own systems and learning for those lessons that others have learned globally. So I really, how many in this room has w read that world perspective study that just came out this year? It's, it was very well done, very well done study. Um, and I don't even, who, who did, was it through NCBA? Is that who commissioned the study? Okay. So some really key findings, I think, that brought to light what all this room has been discussing for a number of years, but I think important, again, for us to concentrate on. So the global trend is for top beef exporting nations to be reactionary. National traceability systems are adopted in responses to major negative events. Contrastly, the U.S. is presented with the opportunity to proactively develop a nationally significant system, potentially resulting in an industry-driven hybrid approach that becomes the global standard. Top takeaways. Global systems tend to delineate between premise identification, individual animal identification, and group lot identification, some or may be voluntary or mandatory. It is not uncommon for third-party entities to manage program databases, thereby protecting industry producer data from freedom of information. Initial tagging of calves tends to be mandatory by a given period of days after birth or animals' first movement off their farm of birth. So those were top-line takeaways from the study. What have we done since 2003 and where are we at today? So we talked about how we've regained access to the export markets through very precise means of animal identification and traceability through some of these verification programs. Now, a gentleman over here at this table said something that I think is really important. A large number of the producers engaged in these programs today are what I would call your early adopters. There's some of your really progressive cattlemen that have stepped up, taken the charge. They've integrated these things into their operation. It is not covering the critical masses of population, which is also really important for simply looking at disease traceback, for disease traceback purposes. So that's an ongoing challenge. I do think, again, with these programs and the standards that's been established, is, is those companies that have put in place these systems have enabled producers to do other things for other markets value added. They've then been uh, because of the premiums given back in those markets, they have seen the value of it, and really the growth has been entirely word of mouth based on the economics in these programs today. So that's why producers are doing it and why they continue to engage every day at a higher level. And considerable growth since 2003. The other thing that I think was really important what this program did is it defined a program compliant tag. And so there was all kinds of discussions around um, individual numbers and the uniqueness of the numbers tied to the premise. And that, you know, we do, we, you can do that um, officially. You can also do it unofficially tied to the database. But, that, but the uniqueness becomes really important, right? So the one-time use tamper evident uniquely numbered ISO compliant tag became the requirement for these verified calves. The reason that's important, because at the end of the day, when you're trying to tie back data to an individual animal, and you've got producers across the country and from Mexico and Canada, having 
you, having standardization around that information becomes really critical. So it became the foundation for the license for the the license for that animal moving forward in these systems allowed, you know, backgrounders to sex and type and move in different directions, allowed feedlots to commingle and come back at the end of the day and not without its problems, but be able to read that tag and identify whether that animal was going to be available or eligible for a given marketplace. The other thing that since we've done since 2003 is ADT. You know, we're all so impatient and and we're all super competitive, which is what I love about our industry, because we're always trying to move quicker and faster, and that's what we need to do. And I would encourage us to do it even at a faster rate. But we did get ADT in place. And so when we look at it from a global market perspective, when I ask USMEF, they're like, you know, from a trading perspective, we've come a long ways. Because now we have ADT that we can use as a negotiating tool, and we now have our um, voluntary systems our export verification programs that have become a way for us to negotiate trade agreements. So we're better than we were. Are we where we all want to be? No. But we should acknowledge the progress that we've had thus far. So again, with the world perspective study, why systems are becoming a global norm, accountability, both to foreign governments, regulatory agencies, as well as foreign and domestic consumers, maintenance or regaining of foreign market access, management of animal health issues, investment in long-term industry practices that provide insurance in the case of animal disease, and as you see, I bolded for use as a talking point tool in market access negotiation efforts. That's more important than you know most of the time. The fact remains that among top exporting countries, nationally significant traceability systems are the norm. The only key import market today, this is important for us to know, that requires traceability is China. And speed of commerce is a crucial aspect, which is why the pilot activity that's happening in Kansas and Texas becomes really important, because that re those really are the areas where we can test a bunch of different things and really look at how we innovate around technology and pulling in those technologies into systems that will allow for real-time data access. Now, these are kind of boring because I just took pictures. They're not boring information. I shouldn't have said it that way, but it's hard to kind of see them up here on the screen. But I pulled out some slides of the World Perspective Study because I think it's important as we think about who we're communicating with. So each and every day at IMI Global, we're talking to cow-calf producers, we're talking to stocker operations, we're talking to packer, we're talking about, and typically we're, we're trying to help them understand a super complex issue most of the time for them, right? Because they're only looking at just their piece of the pie. So what becomes important with the data that came out of the World Perspective study is really understanding what people are thinking just out in the general industry. That becomes important for this group on how we communicate with them, right? So as we know it's a path that would be advantageous for the entire industry, we have to think about how that specifically impacts my dad in southwestern New Mexico or a feedlot in Kansas or a livestock market in Kentucky all at the same time, and we have to know our audience, right? And we all have to work together to improve that communication to them. So these slides are important to me, and I learned a lot. And I thought this study, this study is very relevant because they looked at, I think, 23 different um, significant beef organizations, 70 different stakeholders, super long um, interviews with, with each one of those, and then went out with Aspen Media, to, to do a survey, which was primarily cow-calf producers, but touched everybody in the supply chain, and there were over 600 responses. So it's significant data. So this is the findings. Are you currently participating in a mandatory traceability system other than the USDA ADT system? So you can see there, what is it? I can't see it, 8%, right, said yes. Are you currently participating in a voluntary traceability or animal ID system? 20, almost 22% said yes. So that's a big difference, right? And the two, that's how we have to figure out the two communicating and the collaborative work and working together between the two systems. Participation in voluntary traceability animal ID system by herd size. This is important because you see, as a gentleman spoke here at this table, you see that adoption is happening much quicker with early enrollers, with those guys with larger herd sides, right? That's what you see with this graph. That's what we've all talked about. 
it's important to continue to remember as we implement systems how you impact different segments and different sizes. For what reasons do you choose to participate in a voluntary traceability or animal ID program? You can see the primary reason today for them is that it's value added, right? So they're looking at doing an engagement for those reasons today. This one, how strongly would you support or oppose integration of the system you are participating in with a larger, more nationally significant traceability animal ID system? They were lukewarm on this issue. For what reasons, if any, would you consider participating in a voluntary system? And again, you see value added premiums. Premium, being able to be part of a program, being able to be part of a supply chain where they feel part of. That was where they were participating in livestock identification and traceability. Please rate your level of acceptance with the following traceability animal ID system component. Animals are ID'd at the ranch of origin. Look at this one. Strongly support. Look at that graph line. They strongly supported animals are ID'd at the ranch of origin. Well, that's kind of contrary to what we've been talking, right? So they're strongly in support. Yeah, but this is where it gets all crazy. And they say one thing and then they say another. Please rate your level of acceptance with the following traceability animal ID system component. Information is collected every time an animal physically moves to a new premise. So they were super supportive of animal identification going in at the source of origin. They did not want to have to mess with movement. And if any of you in these systems know why that is, it's because no one's wanting to read animal EID tags when they're loading them on a truck coming off a ranch. It's challenging on wheat pasture to get read-ins and read-outs. It's a headache at a feedlot. How are you, you know, with low frequency identification, how you're going to read tags going on to a truck. So the movement piece becomes very complicated in, in the beef industry. So that's why there's op opposition there, right? How strongly would you support or oppose a mandatory traceability animal ID requirement in addition to those already included in the ADT program? It was either lukewarm or strongly opposed in that study. However, when you ask them, please rate your level of acceptance with the following traceability animal ID system com component. Information is made available to government entities only in the event of an animal disease outbreak. Strongly support. So this is where you get a little bit antagonism, right? So this means we have to work together. We have to figure this out. It's all the stuff this, the panel up here was evaluating earlier and talked through because you're trying to deal with those two separate issues when you look at your constituents. So from a big picture perspective, when you talk about animal identification and traceability globally, you just use that one term. It's kind of like anything else. I call it the unfolding theory. So competition creates an environment where you talk about the positive aspects. So if you can't make a claim to a specific access, aspect of something, then consumers immediately make inferences that you don't have it. So that's oftentimes in the global market how identification and traceability is actually used to differentiate products and to pit one against the other, especially when it comes to trade negotiations. The other thing that's, that's um, super complex today is, is you have a global food industry and very complex supply chains all wanting as much as possible to be able to continue to sell the products in the markets around the world to try to ensure lever, levels of standardization as much as possible that they can, make similar claims in similar markets, have the, have the assurance that the sustainability of those supply chains will be around for the next 30 years and that they can source these products from around the world with fewer and fewer natural resources. So that's what you're dealing with as well. Now, someone said yesterday, don't ever use the term livestock identification traceability and I can't remember who said it, and then talk about sustainability in the same sentence, which I'm going to do right now, so that person can just throw a tomato at me. But there's, um, you know, sus the sustainability of supply chains to a global food system is really important. Sustainability means to me that my dad will be able to hand down his ranch to future generations 
and that we can continue to produce beef products, right? So we have to all be concerned about sustainability of our businesses. Now, one of the efforts that's underway is a Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, and they're looking at putting um, labels on packages. So as part of that program, livestock identification and traceability becomes important because you have verified operations. Those operations are tagged out in databases. That information has to transfer up the supply chain. And Deb can tell you back here with Bix, who manages that data system for CRSB, how complex those issues get. And it becomes critically important when you're tying out credence attributes. So that's why it comes into play when you talk about sustainability efforts. And then you've got the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, that is doing similar things, all good things, trying to address the needs of these global food supply chains. And then as part of that, always what comes into play is animal identification and traceability and the, the, the ability to be able to prove certain things as we move along, whether those are just how we prove where an animal came from and moved to for animal disease purposes, or whether we can prove that the animal was treated X, Y, and Z when it's being marketed under a specific label claim. If transparency is your goal, traceability is always your challenge. It doesn't matter what the industry, and especially when you talk about food systems today. So the World Perspective Study said these are their recommended tenets coming out of that study. Industry-driven, managed and overseen by an entity that includes both private and government interests, maintains data privacy, is equitable, is compatible with common industry practices, operates at the speed of commerce, is credible in domestic and international markets. So kind of when I boil this all down, Here's some of the conclusions from the global perspective. Markets are being accustomed and accepting, which is a good thing, of our current ADT program with the Voluntary Expert Verification Program. So that's, thank goodness, why we've seen um, the increase in global market access that we've seen since 2003. But it took forever to rebuild that, and we don't want to lose it. You have specific country requirements that we're meeting okay today with the, with the programs that we have in place. So again, this is positive. But this does not address the critical masses, nor the issues where we talk about traceability for animal disease traceback purposes, two different issues. So would that impact our global markets? Absolutely. The markets would plummet, right, overnight if we had an animal disease issue. So even though we've got back our market access and things look good from that perspective on what we're exporting today versus where we were, if we had an issue, the markets would plummet, and who knows how markets would react. A lot of how they would ra react would depend on our relationships at a given point in time with those countries, political relations. But what I hope to encourage with this talk is that Globally, for the U.S., we want to, to try to use the best of all systems and move this thing forward. And I do think there's a difference between specificity needed for, the, for moving forward value-added data tied to any sort of labeling claim, tied to a value-added premium. That is very different than trying to get as many people as, or I should say this, as many reads of cattle as possible to help facilitate for, for animal disease traceback. That's why I think both systems are important. So using ultra-high frequency technology to help with speed of commerce to get as many reads as possible is important and continue to evaluate those technologies. And then also building upon the success that we've already had with those systems where specificity is important. Because what I don't want to do is throw out the baby with the bathwater. Because since 2003, we've been working a lot on getting producers with uptake with the systems that we've got in place. And we want to keep encouraging them to do that because it takes years of education to get to the point where we're at. And fortunately, when China came back on, it was, it was fairly rapid that the producers were able to um, a lot of them already had systems in place, but to innovate and get up to speed quickly with that particular market. So with that, I think that's all I have. That's a lot of words.